thank you everybody for joining us for this Ask the Vet with Dr. Marta Greer, Revivals Director of Veterinary Services. We're happy you're here with us today. Our first question, Dr. Greer, when supplementing with DHA through pregnancy, is there a recommended dosage per day? And what are your DHA recommendations? Alexandra is wondering that. Sure, and I don't believe I've ever seen a published dose, so that makes it a little bit tricky. It comes as a capsule, uh, unless you're feeding a diet that has it added. And there are nutritional diets that have those added. Royal Canin has it in some of their foods, their puppy, their HT42D. Um, Imes has it. I believe um, Hills and Purina also add it. So check the label, see if DHA is added. If it is, you may not need to supplement as much. But DHA, we know, improves brain and uh, retinal function, eye function in the, the dogs if their mothers are supplemented during pregnancy from the Canine Companions for Independence Study. So for a small dog, I would probably take a capsule and poke a hole in it, just the usual fish oil capsule that people take, maybe put half of that capsule on a dog's food once a day. For a larger dog, I'd probably use a full capsule. For a big dog, I'd probably use two capsules. You're not gonna hurt them with DHA. It's a, it's a nice product, but I don't think anybody has put together a published dose. I know the pet food companies have established what they put into the food, but I've never seen a published dose to be adding it as an ad additional uh, or individual supplement. So kind of go based on little dogs get less and big dogs get more, but I wouldn't go more than two capsules on it. And even a giant breed dog, I wouldn't go over two capsules. That would be a human adult dose. Um, next question. Actually, there there have been a lot of questions um, on Giardia. <laughs> um, so sure. kind of how to handle both coccidia and Giardia in a kennel setting. Um, some people wondering how to prevent mothers before whelping and after having puppies with this issue. Can you ever fully get rid of it? You know, what about grass in your yard? Can you get rid of it there? Um, just a lot, a lot of questions on Giardia. Yeah, the answer is a hard no. You're going to end up with, if you don't already have Giardia and or coccidia. If you have a group of dogs, you're probably going to end up with it, especially if you're not careful with quarantining new dogs when they come onto your property. So number one, I would not put a new dog onto the property and commingle them in areas where other dogs will be either with the dogs or not with the dogs out there, but in the same yards, gravel, grass, whatever, until you've got a stool sample that's checked and found to be negative at, this, at the veterinary clinic. And in many cases, they're going to need to send that sample out to check for Giardia because the cysts can be very hard to see under the microscope. And you can have dogs that have low enough numbers that you won't see the uh, organism itself. It's a one-celled parasite, but you may find evidence of the uh, protein. So you can send that test out to the diagnostic labs like IDAX and Antec. You can have your vet clinic run it on a Giardia snap test. So there are ways to screen dogs before they come into your facility. Um, pregnancy doesn't have the same, it doesn't transmit through the placenta and through the milk the way that it does for roundworms and hookworms. So it's a somewhat different transmission process. But the things that you can do to prevent both of those organisms would be to bathe your female several days before she's due to have her puppies, give her a good bath, get her good and clean, um, dry her off well. Don't do it the day that she's due to have the puppies, do it several days ahead of time, get her good and clean and dry. Trim up her pants a little bit if she's got a long coat, if you can do that, because the less stool that sticks to her hair around her um, rectal area, the less uh, giardia or coccidia will stick in the stool and then end up transmitted to the puppy. So a good clean environment. And then uh, the best treatment for coccidia will be the Albon um, and those products, but those cannot be given during pregnancy, uh, only after pregnancy. So Albon, trimethoprim sulfa, those are what we recommend. And for Giardia, fenbendazole, I don't use metronidazole during pregnancy or during the time that puppies are nursing. So I will use fenbendazole that is safe during pregnancy, and that can be given on a daily basis at the usual 50 milligram per kilogram dose once a day from the 42nd day of pregnancy to the 14th day of lactation. And then you can repeat that every two weeks if you need to. Puppies should not receive those medications, either Albon or uh, Fenbendazole until they're six weeks old. So you, you may have a time period in there that you can't treat the puppies, but the environment being clean, keep your whelping box clean, disinfect it. Unfortunately, there's really not a disinfectant that kills it in the grass, kills it in the gravel, kills it in your whelping box, but sanitation is always important. So good soap and water, break down the oils and the, the fats in the environment, clean up the organic material, in other words, the feces, keep it good and clean and do the best you can to keep your puppies as um, 
hygienic as you can. We also have the newer wipes, the nursemaid wipes that can be used on the mammary glands and around the honey of the female. So again, that's another way without having to bathe her that you can very successfully keep her clean and it is safe for nursing puppies. Next question. Um, Brenda is wondering, uh, she says her, her female is receiving the topical selamectin revolution six weeks and two weeks before delivery. Does she also need the fenbendazole and ivermectin regimes as well? Sure. So the selamectin will take care of the, the same things that ivermectin will. So from that perspective, you don't need that. But selamectin, it does a good job on heartworm. It does a good job on some intestinal parasites, but it will not get giardia or coccidia. So if you're looking to uh, eliminate those, then fenbendazole will get rid of your giardia and then albon for your coccidia. So that's a great question. We don't want to double up on things. And that selamectin protocol will also reduce the risk of the transmission of intestinal parasites, roundworms through the milk, or I'm sorry, through the placenta and hookworms through the milk and into the puppies. So it's a good protocol to use. Chris is wondering, um, he's hearing about an increase in brucellosis cases. Um, you know, he was, gets them tested within a couple of weeks of breeding. However, when using outside studs, the majority of stud donors or stud owners say they only do testing annually um, as with their tested females. So I guess, what are you hearing regarding brucellosis in that case? Yeah, brucellosis is still out there. We see it in the commercial kennels. We're seeing it in dogs that are being imported into the United States um, from a number of different countries. So you need to be very careful with it. You cannot assume that a dog is brucellosis negative. Uh, and unfortunately, brucellosis will also survive semen freezing. The temperatures of below 300 degrees does not kill brucellosis. So you want to be really careful with your stud dogs. Stud dogs, the general rule of thumb is to test at least twice a year or increasingly more frequently if he has a fertility issue. If he's got any kind of fertility concerns with testicles being uncomfortable, swollen, change in his semen quality, any of those things. And the biggest concern we have right now is that there is not an FDA approved test that is approved for use in the United States for in-office use. So the recommendation is for us to be sending our diagnostic tests out to the diagnostic lab. Um, I was on the task force for the Society for Theriogenology. Those are the people that do canine and other um, animal reproduction in the US. So the Therio group put together a task force. We put together a, a position statement. If you'd like to see what that is, it's at therio.org. That's T-H-E-R-I-O.org. Go to position statement. And then there's also a find a vet feature on that website. So it's a great way for you to find a veterinarian that's nearby you. You can put in your zip code and find a veterinarian that's well-versed in theriogenology because you do want to use somebody that is breeder friendly and is willing to work with uh, breeders and is knowledgeable in this information. So take a look at that brucellosis position statement before you go in, maybe print it off because your veterinarian may not have seen it. It was just published at the end of July. So it's only a month old uh, and not everybody gets to every website every day. I'm going to say that's a pretty safe bet. So uh, not that they're underinformed, but just that they may not be aware that this new position statement has come to be. Um, so it's a great way to educate yourself and your veterinarian with uh, statements from the organization with really smart people that were on the committee that understand brucellosis and testing. Um, next question, and maybe this is related. We also have a lot on allergies. A lot of people are asking about allergies, I suppose, this time of year. <laughs> I know I'm right. suffering from allergies. Um, so this person's wondering what is considered normal paw licking and head shaking? Um, maybe it's allergy related, maybe it's not. Um, but this person has a lab, they're stating, Darren. Um, but what's excessive and when should you be concerned there might be a problem in that case? Yeah, paw licking should not be a normal behavior. So if the dog is licking the, their paws, chewing them, anything like that, there's probably a component of allergies. Ears are a little bit of a different story. Some ear problems are related to allergies. Some are related to swimming, being wet all the time, the humidity, the kind of environment that they're in, if they've gotten water in the ears during baths, uh, how you're managing their ear health. So I would be a little less harsh on an ear infection, but I would still be cautious about it because allergies are an inherited disorder and we don't want to produce puppies that have allergies or that we know are likely to produce dogs with allergies. It's a it's a chronic management issue that will be expensive for owners to manage and the dogs are uncomfortable. Um, additionally, the medications that we put dogs on to manage their allergies, such as prednisone, atopica, cytopoint, and um, uh, the others. Um, so there's cytopoint, atopica, uh, Apoquel, 
prednisone, we don't want the dogs on those medications during pregnancy. So we need to be really careful that we are not reading dogs that are going to hand this off to the next generation. Nadine is wondering, when a dog is in labor, what conditions should require an emergency trip to the vet? When should you be concerned? Oh, the list is about 15 or 20 items long. Um, first and foremost, I would say if you feel like something's wrong, trust your instincts. Call the vet, call the emergency clinic, whoever's available for you. Give them a call, let them know what you're seeing and express your concerns and get some help. Because if you feel like something's not right, then I would trust your instincts to uh, go that route. Um, the other things that we are concerned about is if the female vomits repeatedly, um, that's reason for concern. If she's losing excessive amounts of blood, that's reason for concern. If you see green vaginal discharge prior to the delivery of the first puppy, that signals the placental separation, which means that the puppy's not getting blood flow. After the first puppy is born, you will see green because, or you may see green because the placenta on the prior puppy has separated. So that is not reason for concern. But if you see green before the first puppy is born, if you can't get the puppy to be delivered in a reasonable amount of time, that being two hours of hard pushing on the first puppy, more than an hour on a subsequent puppy, now she can rest in between. But if she's pushing and not being productive, not getting the puppy out, I would go in. If you put on gloves, a gloved finger or gloved couple of fingers and you can reach in, but you can't get a hold of the puppy and you're seeing a prolonged labor, I'd be concerned. If you're losing puppies, if puppies are being born dead, um, those are reasons for concern. So it's a, it's a pretty long list of about 15 or 20 items. But essentially, I trust your instincts. And if your instincts are something's not right, she didn't do this last time, or this isn't what my dogs usually do when they're in labor, um, she, the puppy looks like it's in the wrong position, she, you know, something isn't going well, then by all means uh, proceed. There are appropriate ways to give oral calcium and to give injectable oxytocin with your veterinarian's input and insights. But overuse of a particularly oxytocin can cause damage to the uterus, can shrink wrap the puppies, can cause the uterus to rupture. Um, I have seen a uterine rupture. Um, it is not a good thing for the puppy. It is definitely not a good thing for the mom. So don't wait too long. If you are under the impression that things just aren't going the way that it should be, then get yourself some veterinary intervention, get some help. Carol, uh, just have some questions about patella issues um, and regarding surgery, even for toy breed puppies, um, just a few months old, maybe just strained it. So um, just kind of wondering what can they do to help a female during pregnancy to help reduce the risk or strengthen those soft tissues in the puppies? Okay. And maybe just talk a little bit about what patella is for those who may not know. Sure. So the patella is the kneecap. So on the dog's back leg, it's the part of the leg that points forward toward their head. That's the same as your kneecap. Uh, so the patella is that little bone that sits in your kneecap or, or is your kneecap. And uh, there is a strong genetic component of inheritance to this disorder. So if you wanna prevent puppies from having patellar luxation, don't breed parents that have patellar luxation, period, end of discussion. There really isn't much else I can say about that. There's no preventive, there's no supplement, there's no exercise, there's nothing you can do just don't breed parents that have it. And it's easy to have it screened for. There's no x-ray involved. Your veterinarian can feel the kneecaps with their hands and they can position the leg in different um, flex and flexion positions to see if the kneecap pops on and off. And if it doesn't, then it's probably okay. If it does, it probably isn't. Um, now, really young dogs tend to have a little bit easier time. You can push those patellas off a little bit more easily because their soft tissues are still developing. So I don't like to be too aggressive in palpation because you don't want to injure the puppy by too aggressively moving the patella. If the dog does have evidence of patellar luxation, I don't think any dog should have surgery, orthopedic surgery for a condition like that until it's reached skeletal maturity, which means after the first heat cycle or after the uh, testes are mature. So the dog should go through puberty before you do anything surgical so that you know what their full uh, skeletal changes are going to be. And this is another reason not to spay or neuter our dogs really young before they have skeletal maturity, because we do increase the risk of patellar luxation, hip dysplasia, and other orthopedic conditions by spaying or neutering too early. If we spay or neuter young before they go through heat or before they reach puberty and go through skeletal maturity, the legs actually don't end up with that nice angulation where the hip 
is here, the knee is in front of it, the hock is behind it, and the foot is below the hip. That should be that kind of a V-shaped uh, limb. And if we spay and neuter young, we end up making the growth plates close too late. So the legs grow longer and straighter. And it's really important that we don't do those early spay and neuters because we do put our dogs at increased risk of orthopedic problems, different forms of cancer, allergies, a lot of different things, which goes down a different rabbit hole. So basic bottom line is don't let your veterinarian spay or neuter your pet until they're through skeletal, skeletal maturity. And if they do think they have patellar luxation, don't be in a hurry to cut that because it is um, a big deal to try and reposition that before the puppy has developed their full skeletal system. Next question, Parvo. Um, obviously, a few people have, have talked about that. Um, yeah. Joy, in this particular situation, uh, she works with a rescue community, um, has for many years, and she's saying over the past year, they've seemed like cases of Parvo like never before. Um, they kind of, she's wondering, is there a new strand? Uh, she said mm -hmm. she's got puppies and dogs that seem to be healthy one day, sick right. next. Um, you know, I guess, what are you hearing about this? Is there a new variant? What are your thoughts and suggestions? There are probably not new strains of parvo, but there are certainly puppies that get parvo, especially if it's combined with coronavirus at the same time, that take the puppies out so fast they don't even look like they're sick. They go from being normal to being deceased in hours. So that's number one. Number two is there's a new product coming to market, and I believe that's why Elanco had the webinar last night for veterinarians. So this is just something that's about to come to market, I believe, in September. It's a monoclonal antibody that will deliberately and specifically block parvovirus. It's given intravenously. It has to be kept frozen. It needs to be administered by a veterinarian intravenously. Uh, but it is going to be a complete and total game changer for people that have gotten parvo into their facilities. Now, we do have some really good articles on parvovirus, both prevention and management of that disease. But management is going to change completely. Until now, we've done IV fluids, maybe plasma. Um, Serenia as an anti-nausea drug, Convenia as an antibiotic, supportive care. Those things have all been really useful in managing puppies that have parvo, but the monoclonal antibody that Elanco is bringing to market, and I'm not even sure what the name of it's going to be yet, is going to be a complete and total game changer. Will it be expensive? Yes, but it's also expensive to lose puppies. So it's going to completely change the game. The other thing to realize is that parvo does not stand alone. Yes, it's a virus, but if you have good environmental control of health, you have cleaned up your raccoon latrines so that dogs aren't bringing parvo into your facility, you're quarantining dogs before they come into your facility. You're deworming your puppies at two, four, six, and eight weeks of age so that they're not parasite ridden. All of those things are going to reduce the risk that your dogs get parvovirus. So it's really important that we do a great job with parasite control and vaccination is not going to get you completely out of this. We don't recommend vaccinating until they're at least six weeks old and not any more often than every two weeks. There are places that feel like if a vaccination every two weeks is good, then more often is better and it's actually not. So please don't vaccinate your puppies any more often than every 14 days. Even the most important uh, information that was shared last night from the um, Association of Shelter Veterinarians indicated that two week intervals are as close together as you should be vaccinating. So don't think of a little is good, more is better. Make, make sure your deworming is fine. Make sure your bitches are up to date on their vaccines. And you can do nomograms on your females, which is a blood test, a titer to establish what their antibody level is. The University of Wisconsin at their CAVID lab at CAVID, um, that's Lori Larson's lab. It used to be Ron Schultz's. They can do nomograms, which can tell you what the bitch's immune status is and therefore customize vaccination protocols for your puppies. So there are some great tools that we have out there, but honestly, the Elanco monoclonal antibody uh, treatment is going to be a complete and total game changer. It's going to save so many lives. It's going to be unbelievable. We personally, in our practice, administered it to 30 dogs for a safety study. So I've handled the product. I've handled the drug. It's really safe. It's really great. And I think that uh, people need to pay attention to that as their fallback, but not instead of good hygiene, not instead of good deworming, and certainly not in, instead of a great vaccination protocol with the appropriate vaccines. Work with your veterinarian on that. Okay, our next question comes from Lisa. Um, she's wondering, is it okay to continue heart guard and frontline throughout pregnancy and lactation? Sure, so frontline is labeled as safe during pregnancy and lactation. Heart guard is also, uh, some products are, some are not. So you need to read your labels. 
Uh, we do have a list of products in the revival family um, group of articles that we can uh, share with you if you're looking. So the only oral flea and tick medication that's safe during pregnancy is going to be Revecto. Um, Semperica, Fidelio, and Nexgard are not labeled as safe during breeding for breeding animals, pregnancy, or lactation. So if you're going to use an oral, use Brevecto. If you're going to use a topical, use Frontline or one of the uh, Fipronil products, those we know are safe. Vectra is not safe. Um, we don't have it tested. We don't have Soresto tested. So we don't know if those are safe or not. For heartworm preventions, all of them other than uh, Trifexis, which contains Spinosad, um, Comfortis, that has also not been tested in breeding animals. Breeding meaning dogs that are intended for breeding, male and female, dogs that are pregnant, dogs that are lactating. So be very careful with the products that you're using for your flea and tick and your heartworm control. The injectable ProHeart 6 and ProHeart 12, that's moxidexin. That is labeled as safe during pregnancy. So we have good drugs. You just need to make sure that you're using the right ones and not just whatever your vet says, here, use this for heartworm or flea and tick. They may use it for all their other patients, but for animals that are in a breeding program, you should be reading your labels. And it's easy for you to find that information. You just need to search in Google the product name, and then you put in product insert PDF. It'll bring up that big product insert that comes in the package if you don't have it. It unfolds like a map, like you can never fold it again. You know how that is. It never goes back to the same shape that it was before you unfolded it. But you can pull it up online. And then you can read through the safety literature and make sure that the products that you're taking home for your pets are safe for pregnancy, lactation, and breeding, meaning male dogs as well as female. Kind of as a follow-up, if a dog has been on heartworm meds, is it necessary to do a test, a heartworm test every year? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, number one, sometimes dogs have breaks in protection. Either you stopped because it was seasonal or the dog spit it out or vomited up the medication or the dog dropped it. And then the other dog swooped in and grabbed it before you realized that uh, both dogs didn't get their dose, that one dog got two doses and the other dog got zero. And there are several new strains of heartworm that over the last 10 or 15 years have been being watched. They started off mostly in the Tennessee Valley and now they're spreading to other parts of the country that are resistant to the medications. So it is important that you are testing on an annual basis. You cannot assume because your dog was on preventive that they are protected, unfortunately, because of the resistant strains. So I think um, the moxidectin, which is the... Um, product that's in the injectable ProHeart and Pro12, and there are some oral forms of that, are going to probably be the most effective at this point in those parts of the country where we see resistance. And I'm pretty sure that the pharmaceutical companies, even though they're not telling us this, are working on new molecules that they will be bringing to market. But in the meantime, don't assume that your product is 100% effective because we know it's not. From Melinda, she's wondering, my cattery has an outbreak of ringworm. Um, mm -hmm. What are your treatments for ringworm? What's your suggestion there? Yeah, probably the most effective treatment is lime sulfur dip. It's smelly. It's hard to use. Man, that stuff does an amazing job. Uh, it does have to be diluted. It does require bathing the cats, which as anyone that's ever tried to bathe a cat knows, cats aren't big fans of the water and being bathed and showered and rinsed and all those things. But lime sulfur is probably the safest and the most effective way to manage it. Um, there are some oral antifungals that can be used, mostly um, the ter terbenafin um, can be used, but again, you want to be really careful during pregnancy and lactation. Um, we know griseofulvin is not safe. That was one of the older medications. Um, some of them are probably safe at certain stages, so be very cautious in using them. If you don't know the pregnancy status, uh, be, be aware that there are limits on age that you have to watch as well. So really, lime sulfur can be used during any time and can be used on babies. Um, and it's stinky. Oh, man, it smells terrible. You need to wear gloves. You need to ventilate well. But it will be your fastest way out of a ringworm outbreak. Uh, you know, usually the best way isn't the easiest way, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, for a while, Lufrenuron was an oral medication that was in some of the um, heartworm preventives. That was thought at one time from some reports out of Israel that it would be effective in managing ringworm. And that has largely been shown not to be true. So we're back to the basics of lime sulfur. Speaking of Lyme, that was going to be my next question. Not Lyme sulfur, but Lyme's disease. <laughs> uh, very different thing. Um, a lot of people are asking about Lyme disease, the vaccine. Um, is that vaccine necessary? I guess, you know, what do they need a booster shot for that? Um, talk a little bit about the, the Lyme vaccine. 
Sure. So of all the tick-borne diseases that we see, Lyme disease is probably the most um, nasty one. Uh, we do also see anaplasmosis, ehrlichia. We see um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever uh, in certain parts of the country, especially the upper Midwest and the East Coast around uh, Connecticut, New Hampshire, those areas. Lyme disease is a big deal. It's carried by probably more than one tick. It's probably not just the deer tick, but other ticks as well that carry it. And what's interesting to me is the number of people that have their dogs show positive on their tests for Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and or Ehrlichia. And some dogs will have multiple infections, including my daughter's dog. And people will say to me, oh, there's no way my dog has Lyme disease. I never found a tick. Well, the ticks can be very small. The nymph stages and the, the early stages are very small. They are very hard to see. They can be smaller than a freckle on a dog, can be really difficult to locate. And it is very easy for those diseases to be transmitted through tick bites. So the bottom line is Lyme vaccinations are a good product to use to prevent Lyme disease. And it does a good job, but it's not the only thing you should be doing if you're in an area with ticks, because just because you vaccinated for Lyme disease does not give your dog protection against the other tick-borne diseases like anaplasmosis, like Ehrlichia, and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And there's probably 30 or more diseases out there we don't even know about. I mean, there isn't a test for, there, there isn't a diagnosis, but I am certain because we see dogs that respond to doxycycline when we don't really have a good reason for them to, we didn't find anything on the test that they get better on doxycycline. So I would be really suspicious that as we become better at making diagnosis of some of these tick-borne diseases, that we're gonna find that there are diseases out there we didn't even know about. So you should combine, if you're in an area with a lot of ticks, you should combine your Lyme vaccination with your uh, tick preventions. And that can either be the orals, the topicals, or the collars, depending on the reproductive status of your dog. So yes, Lyme vaccinations are very effective. There's a couple of companies that make very good products. There's typically two vaccinations given the first year with an annual booster, so don't forget to booster it. And um, although that helps a lot, it's not gonna completely prevent it. Uh, last spring, last May, I had three dogs in our practice that died from Lyme disease because of Lyme nephritis that affected their kidneys. And it was absolutely tragic. One was pregnant, two were not. They were healthy dogs. All three were Labradors and they all three were apparently healthy and then they were deceased. It was just that fast within days. We lost them even in spite of really aggressive therapy with antibiotics, fluids, uh, plasma infusions, all kinds of things that we did for these dogs we lost all three of them. And we had a golden retriever that got sick. Uh, Bernese mountain dogs, Labradors, Goldens, those are at increased risk genetically. They probably have a tendency to have Lyme disease. So be very, very careful with the products that you're um, using and really think hard about it. Work with your veterinarian, look at your risk assessment. Um, there's a really great bunch of maps on the CAPC vet website at C-A-P-C-V-E-T, CAPC vet, which stands for Companion Ar Animal Parasite Council. You can go in there and write down to your zip code, like in your neighborhood, you can look at the map. You can see how many dogs were diagnosed with Lyme, heartworm, anaplasmosis, ehrlichia, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, a number of other diseases. They also have a feline map uh, for the cat diseases. So if you're really curious about this, go in, put in your zip code and see what's happening in your neighborhood. And you're going to be like, oh my goodness, here I didn't know all these things were happening. So take a look at that and assess your dog or cat's risk for some of those diseases, and then respond to that by working with your veterinarian for the appropriate preventions, both vaccinations and uh, flea and tick control medications. This person is wondering, they say they have a female dog that had her first season at one and a half years of age. Um, they've heard that they've heard you talk before and you've discussed the Breeders Edge Be Strong before as a product to potentially use in this situation. Um, they're wondering, is this something that would help? Do you put it on a daily, um, just for a certain pound of, of a period of time? Um, how should that be used? Well, I guess I'm not really sure what their question is, because that's a normal thing for a dog to have a heat cycle at one and a half year of age. Um, I wouldn't be concerned about that. And um, there really aren't any great drugs to bring dogs into heat. So basically, you need to give them a chance to grow up and mature. Um, there's a lot to be said about nutrition, lighting, other environmental issues, other dogs in the environment. So it's nice to have a male dog in the household that can tell you if she's in heat. You want to make sure she's getting at least 14 hours of daylight so that she's getting enough daylight for her to have normal ovarian function. So if she's in a, 
a kennel that you turn the lights off, or if she's in a bedroom where the blinds are shut, if she's in a basement where you have stuff stacked on top of crates, there may be inadequate amounts of light for her to cycle. And nutrition is absolutely critical. So the Be Strong um, is a very helpful product, but all alone, it's not going to take care of your concerns. So I like to put the dogs on either a Royal Canin or a Purina Sport 3020 diet because we see a lot better fertility on those particular diets. So look at your nutrition. I see a lot of problems with um, other diets that aren't really meant to be all life stage. And the problem is reading the label, it can be very difficult to assess the micronutrients in your pet food. Macronutrients are fat, protein, and carbohydrates. Easy to take a look at, easy to see what those concentration levels are, the percentages, but the micronutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, the amino acid supplements that are in the life stage foods of Purina Sport 3020 and Royal Canin HT42D are there for reproduction. So take a look at those diets. The first thing I do is ask people what they feed. The second thing I do is ask what else do they feed because nobody just feeds dog food. They always add something. And the third thing is what supplements. So that's where the Be Strong comes in is third. After environment, after lighting, after all those other things, then we talk about Be Strong. So it is not the first thing that I reach for. And it, I think it's successful because I think a lot of our diets are, are deficient in um, some of the micronutrients, but don't reach for that until you've gotten the other things under control first. Somebody wondering, is it possible for a female to not have a stricture band and just be tight for her first time breeding? Oh yeah, that's normal. If she's never used a reproductive tract, it's not going to be large and compliant. Absolutely normal. Uh, Chris is wondering, kind of a follow-up to an earlier question, do I still need to worm um, puppies at two weeks old if the female received fenbendazole at 42 days or two weeks post whelp? If you gave it every single day for five weeks, you don't need to worry about roundworms and hookworms. You can still have Giardia. So it depends on how you use the protocol. If you give it on the 42nd day and at the 14th day, you still have parasites. If you give it every single day from the 42nd day all the way until the puppies are 14 days old, that's every day for five weeks, 35 doses, then you should not have roundworms and hookworms in the in those young puppies. They should be protected. Debbie is wondering, can you advise about expirations on vaccinations? She specifically said the DAPPV. Um, it is important. Is it What if they're just a little bit expired? Is that okay? When should you draw yeah. the line? Expired is expired. It should be stored correctly in a refrigerator, not on the door so that the temperature changes as you open and close the refrigerator door. You should make sure that uh, you are um, using it before the expiration date. You should make sure you don't make it up more than two hours ahead of using it. You should make sure it's for the right species, the right age, all those things. But expired is expired. And because vaccines are a living organism, it's an actual virus in many cases, not just, a, it's not like a medication like aspirin is just a molecule. These are actual organisms. So unless you have a current date on it, those vaccines are probably not effective. So don't use expired vaccines. A lot of people are asking about um, preventing puppies, fading puppy syndrome. Um, obviously, that's always an issue that a lot of people struggle with. Um, this particular person is saying, you know, they, they do everything. They've clearly watched you talk before, you recommend they do tube feeding, put them in an incubator with oxygen, um, but the pups are still dying. So um, any more advice, I guess, any suggestions on that? Well, there is no fading puppy syndrome as a diagnosis. It's a description. It just tells us that puppies have died, but it doesn't tell us why. So we need to look at the puppy's weight, urine color, temperature, and uh, oxygenation. So the incubator helps, the tube feeding helps, all those things are important. But if you're losing puppies, we need to be looking at, is there an infectious disease? Is there a genetic predisposition that these two parents don't produce healthy puppies? Is there an environmental issue? Is the bitch not lactating adequately? Is she not a good mother? Um, how big are they when they're born? How many puppies are in your litter? Those are all really important things. What were their APGAR scores when they were born? So I think if you've probably watched some of these videos, you've gone through that. And if you've done all those things and you're still losing puppies, I strongly encourage people to send those puppies into the diagnostic lab to make sure that they're getting a diagnosis for what's going on. Now, not all diagnostic labs are created equal. Some are really great at infectious diseases and other disorders that puppies die from. Others are like, yep, it's dead. And that's really all they tell you. So make sure you're using your veterinary 
uh, clinic and the diagnostic lab that they have faith in. If they have any questions about it, they can certainly contact me. I'm happy to talk to veterinarians about submission. Um, there are great diagnostic labs and then there are some that are just really not useful at all. So if you're gonna spend your money on shipping the puppy and getting an answer, you need to use a reliable lab that will produce an answer for you. There's always an answer. Um, are you dipping the cords in iodine? What are the other things that are happening in your facility? Is it all one line of dogs? Is it multiple breeds? You know, there's a thousand questions that go with this. So um, I understand your frustration. It's really hard to lose puppies. It's it's very painful emotionally and financially, but we can help get you an answer if we work with your veterinary clinic on submission of those puppies. So if you lose any, refrigerate, do not freeze and contact us and we'll help you get them submitted. You know, there's a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of information, all sorts of things. Um, this person's asking about vaccines. They see on things on YouTube saying vaccinations aren't safe or, you know, you, sh you shouldn't vaccinate. Um, I guess, what are your thoughts there regarding vaccination? Well, we have not eradicated the diseases that we can protect puppies against with vaccinations, particularly parvo. We've spoken about that already today. Parvo is still out there. It's still rampant. It is not unusual to have parvovirus run through a facility, a kennel, uh, a, a rescue, a boarding facility, whatever. Um, vaccines really have probably been the single most important breakthrough that we've had in medicine, probably more important than anesthesia, more important than antibiotics, certainly more important than chemotherapy and cancer treatments in the number of lives that we've saved by vaccinations. So I cannot say that I would discredit vaccinations. Are there some that I think are better than others? Oh, yes, I think there are. But the basic distemper parvo vaccinations with adenovirus in them that we give to young dogs, rabies vaccinations. Um, I mean, if you go to other countries, people die of rabies. People die of rabies. In the United States, on average, one person dies of rabies a year in the US. In other countries like the Philippines and India, thousands and thousands of people die from rabies. So it's um, hard for me to understand why you would not feel like there's a, a strong benefit to vaccinations. Should you use them correctly? Yes, they are one of the strongest things that you can put into your dog's body. So I'm careful how I give them. I'm careful which ones I select. I'm careful how I space them out. I'm careful how I use them, how I administer them, who I recommend what for based on their lifestyle and risk assessment. But I think lumping all vaccinations into a category of they're not safe is really um, a doing a disservice to you, your family, your dogs, to the things that we can do, because we have saved millions and millions and millions of lives, dogs, human, um, cattle, horses, you name it, the species. If we can vaccinate, we are saving lives, but not without judicious use of those vaccinations. So um, do titers, be smart about it, space them out, use your veterinarian, use the risk assessment protocols on the American Animal Hospital Association and the American Feline Practitioners Association websites. That's AAFP and AHA, AAHA. So look up those information pieces, uh, find the information that you need, work with your veterinarian, but don't throw vaccines out the window because they are life-saving um, products that we have on the human and veterinary side. They're hugely successful in saving lives. Lisa has a couple questions regarding AI, um, kind of the difference between natural and and AI breeding, and will a male naturally mount if he is collected for AI? So AI, we have to be careful when we use this now because AI is now also meaning artificial intelligence. So I, <laughs> we wanna make sure we're talking about artificial insemination. Um, so AIs probably don't get you quite as many pregnancies or quite as many puppies as you get with a natural breeding, but they're better than missing a breeding. Um, some male dogs need some practice before they figure out how to mate a female or how to be collected. So with some practice, some experience, you can get these guys to understand what you're asking them to do. You want to use a quiet room. You want to use somebody with a, some experience. You don't need the whole neighborhood there watching. Um, sometimes dogs have been told no so many times by their primary person that they live with that they flat out refuse to collect because they've been told no, 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 no. So they're like, mm -mm, not doing it. Uh, sometimes the female has been intimidating to the male if you tried to introduce them too soon and the female turned around and snarked at him, then he may be reluctant to go ahead and mount. Uh, so do be thoughtful about how you do your AIs and do understand that there is a learning curve for these boys to figure out what you're asking them to do. So um, artificial insemination is a great tool. We use it a lot in our practice because we do have people that are using sophisticated breeding systems like Fresh Chilled 
and frozen semen. So I rely heavily on artificial insemination, but it has to be done correctly and you have to give the male a chance to figure out what you're asking him to do. We have a couple questions on prenatal supplements and folic su supplements. Um, this person had their first cleft palate on a Pembroke and um, just kind of wondering, you know, would folic supplements help and dosing and how long and what do you recommend when it comes to that? Sure. So folic acid, there was a pu published article in 2013 out of Poland that demonstrates that they reduce the risk of cleft palates. Um, which was one of the midline defects in small breed brachycephalic dogs, specifically, I think it was chihuahuas and French bulldogs. So there's definitely a benefit to using folic acid. Um, in Pembroke West Corgis, they tend to also have a possibility of cleft palates. It can be genetic. Um, it can be genetic in any breed, but it's more common in the brachycephalics, the short faced dogs, the Shih Tzus, the Lhasas, the Frenchies, the Pugs, the Bulldogs. Um, so those brachycephalic dogs do have an increased risk. And even genetically, though, their tendency to have that cleft palate, we can reduce that risk with folic acid. The only published dose is five milligrams per dog per day. Um, HT42D, which is the pregnancy diet that Royal Canin makes, does have folic acid added to it. So if you don't have a uh, brachycephalic dog, you probably don't need to supplement more. If you do have a brachycephalic, I probably would anyway. Um, folic acid comes in 400 microgram capsules. So if you wanted to get to a five milligram, the published dose, that would be 12 a day. That's not practical for most people to give 12 to their dog. And I think it's unnecessary, but a small breed dog, I would easily give 400 micrograms twice a day. A larger breed dog, maybe a Corgi, I would do two to four of those a day. Um, we don't have a great published dose other than the one. And I think we would look, really benefit from more research, but right now that's all we have, but I would never hesitate to do it. It's a B vitamin, it's water soluble. If you give too much, it comes out in the urine and it doesn't hurt to do that. Now, the other thing to be aware of is that besides genetics, there can be environmental causes of cleft palates. Typically that's if a steroid or some other drug like a trimethoprim sulfa antibiotic was given to the bitch at certain stages of her pregnancy. So be really careful what you're giving during pregnancy. Pregnancy should not be um, taken for granted. It should be a drug-free period of time other than the drugs that we know are going to improve the quality of the pregnancy like fenbendazole. So be aware of that. But um, yes, folic acid can be used. Yes, you need to do it. If you're going to do it, you should start six weeks or more before the heat cycle starts. So don't wait until she's pregnant or at the ultrasound because by then you've missed that window of opportunity. We, Polly is wondering, is gabapentin effective as a standalone general pain medication? Probably not. It will help with a neuro pain, nerve pain, like back pain, um, certain other kinds of nerve pain. You, it can be safely used with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Medicam, Rimadil, Carprofen, Meloxicam, uh, Galaprant, but standalone, it's probably insufficient for most pain. Uh, depends on the pain in young dogs, like puppies under six weeks of age. It's a good choice because we don't have renal function and or kidney function and liver function that will allow us to give non-steroidals. Some dogs can't take non-steroidals because of other health conditions. So we may have to use gabapentin along with some other things, but GABA alone is probably not enough for most dogs that are having arthritis or other pain. Um, there is a nice pain medication on the market right now, another monoclonal antibody medication for cats called Silencia for cats with arthritis. And Labrella is going to be the dog equivalent to that coming to market. Both of them are Zoetis products. Uh, last week, I had a chance to see some of the videos from the Labrella dogs in clinical studies done over in England. And it's going to be, again, another game changer in the quality of life that these dogs have. So watch for Labrella. If you have a cat, look at Silencia. Uh, they are probably going to cost less than most non-steroidal anti-inflammatories on a monthly basis. It's an injection given by your vet clinic once a month. And compared to the cost of Rimadil, uh, Medicam, and some of the other drugs that we have, it's probably going to be less expensive. And it's absolutely phenomenal how much better those dogs feel and walk and are moving. So look for those to come to market if you're looking for some help in your pain medications. Besides proper nutrition, is there a recommended supplement uh, to prepare a male for collection? 
Um, if a male is normal, he probably doesn't need much. If he's got any fertility issues or his nutrition isn't adequate, then yes, you probably do need something. Um, we have four male supplements at Revival. We have problem male for the dogs that are already experiencing some fertility issues like poor semen quality. We have get them going if we have a dog with low libido that needs some help getting the collection accomplished. We have um, in between for him. We also have an in between for her, but that's not what the question is. And then we have um, oxy studs. So we have four great products depending on where your dog is in his reproductive cycle. But again, back like we talked about the female bringing her into heat. The first thing is to look at your basic environment and your basic nutrition. So if the dog is not on a quality nutritional plane, they're already behind the eight ball. So nothing you're going to supplement is going to fix that problem. So again, I'm pretty heavy on let's do Purina or let's do Royal Canin. And I can tell you hundreds of stories of people that have had very good successes with those diets when they've had previous failures on other nutrition. Uh, so uh, just be really aware of what you're feeding. Take a look at it. If you've always fed it and you've had good fertility, it doesn't mean you're going to continue to. Nutritional products change from time to time. The diet companies, because of commodity market changes, change their formulas. And sometimes we see nutritional needs starting to slide because of that. So I've been sticking with the Purina and the Royal Canin products and having very good success. My personal dogs eat Royal Canin and I would not feed them anything other than that or Purina for great success in reproduction. Somebody is wondering, is it necessary to continue progesterone testing once she has reached 4NG? Oh boy, yes. So my own personal dog, one of them, um, got as far as four and then failed to ovulate two heat cycles in a row. Um, even though she was being fed appropriately and everything else was going well, she's um, got a cystic ovary and that is not going to respond to nutrition. So yes, you do need to make sure that she rises above five. I usually like to see it 10 or higher before I stop the testing. Um, just be aware that they don't always rise the way that you expect them to. And if they fail to rise, you're not going to have a pregnancy. And then at 30 days, when you do your ultrasound or at 60 days, when you're expecting a litter of puppies and you don't have one, you're not going to have an explanation for what happened. So please be aware that you should see one test above five, um, preferably 10 or above before you stop the testing. I know we talked about Giardia and Coccidia earlier. Lori's wondering, do you still recommend deworming for both Coccidia and Giardia, even if you've never had a history of either one? No. If you have negative fecals, you don't see coccidia, you don't see giardia, you don't have a giardia positive antigen test, I would not administer medications if it's not necessary. So no, I would only treat if I have it or if I have diarrhea and I can't figure out what's going on and I take a sample in and find out that that's what I have, um, then yes, you should appropriately treat, but not unnecessarily. Um, somebody's wondering if you have an open front nail at birth, by what age will it generally close? They said it's a Pembroke or when is it time to worry? Yeah, a Pembroke should not have an open fontanelle at birth. Um, the brachycephalics, the chihuahuas, the dome-headed dogs, Pomeranians, um, a lot of those can. And we can see hydrocephalus even if the dog doesn't have an open fontanel. I'm taking care of a golden retriever right now, a puppy that has a very domed head and hydrocephalus, but is does not have an open fontanel. Um, so the fontanel should either not be open or should be closed within a, a few days of birth. So I'd be concerned in a Pembroke that has an open fontanel that I have a problem with hydrocephalus or some other neurologic condition. Trina is wondering, she says she has a well-bred female um, who had an open pio first heat cycle. She was treated with Batril, Alizin, oh my goodness, a big long P word that I don't know if I could say, so, and she's used that successfully. She is fully <laughs> health screamed, um, has her CHIC, and I'm really hoping for a successful litter, um, sure. I guess. What your thoughts are? <laughs> so don't skip a heat cycle when she comes into heat breeder. I was talking to a client yesterday that was in my exam room that her female just produced her third litter after a pyometra. So she had a pyo. We've successfully treated her. She bred her three times in a row. This last litter, she had seven puppies with frozen semen on a 40 pound dog. So a seven puppy litter on a dog that size, 
very successful litter. So you absolutely can get pregnancies to happen after pyometras if you don't spay them, but do not skip a heat cycle. You need to do breeder back to back to back. You need to talk about nutrition. You need to talk to your veterinarian about whether an antibiotic is appropriate during the next breeding, but those are all great things. So congratulations on not spaying her and get her pregnant. You're going to run out of time if you don't do it soon. Uh, Lisa's wondering if a female dog is C-sectioned, must she be spayed? Will C-sectioning affect her ability to produce milk? Will it, if not spayed, affect the number of puppies and subsequent breedings? <laughs> do not spay at C-section. Do not spay at C-section. And if I didn't mention it, do not spay at C-section. There are a lot of veterinarians that do spay. There are veterinarians who will hold you hostage because they they will tell you that they won't do a C-section for you if you don't spay her. But bitches lose 30% of their blood volume if they are spayed at C-section, which is immediately going to put her into shock and put her at risk of developing um, shock and perhaps passing away. So we absolutely do not spay at C-section in our practice and in most practices where people do a lot of reproduction and theriogenology. Um, if you breed her again, she can absolutely successfully have another litter um, if she's not spayed, obviously. Uh, so C-sections do not interfere with future fertility. That being said, they don't need their ovaries to produce milk. So from that perspective, they don't need them, but it is very unsafe. Ligatures can slip off of those great big blood vessels. Dogs automatically lose 30% of their blood volume and you take the uterus and put it in the trash. Um, it's very risky to spay a dog at C-section. It's much safer to put the uterus back together and later on spay her if it's appropriate, if you decide that you're not gonna breed her again, but I would never consent to a C-section with a spay unless the uterus had completely fallen apart. And I've only seen that once, once. And I've been doing surgery on dogs for C-sections for 42 years. So if it was common, I'd have been seeing it. Alexandra actually kind of has a follow-up question. So when you're ready to retire your female from breeding, um, when do you recommend as the best time to spay her following her last litter? Yeah, so I like the puppies weaned at least for four weeks so that the mammary glands are dried up and it's easier for the incision to be open and closed without a lot of blood flow. Um, that being said, you can do it anytime that she's not in heat, but more than four weeks after the puppies are weaned. Um, I do recommend spaying them after you're done using her for a breeding program because of the risk of pyometra. Pyometra happens on average in 25% of dogs that are over uh, middle-aged. So it's a very common condition. It can be a fatal condition. And if you don't end up losing your dog to it, it can be a very expensive condition to treat. Now the International Symposium for Canine and Feline Reproduction had an article in 2012 about the incidence of pyometra based on breed. So if anybody's looking, you can go to Google Scholar and, and type that in, or if you choose to email us, I'll send you a copy of that article or a link to the article. Um, and it will uh, define for you which breeds are at increased risk. Bernese Mountain Dogs have a 46% chance of pyometra. The other breeds in that list were Leonbergers, Great Danes, Case Hounds, um, American Staffordshire Bull Terriers, um, mostly giant breed dogs, Rottweilers. Uh, so in the top uh, 10 dogs. They were mostly giant breed dogs of European descent, other than the Quezon, which is not a giant breed dog, but still of Northern European descent. So important to spay when you're done with a breeding program, but never at the C-section. Somebody's asking, what's the difference between a spay and OSS? An OSS is an ovary sparing spay, otherwise known as a hysterectomy. So we leave the ovaries or ovary, one or both in those situations, meaning that the female will still have heat cycles. There are definitely benefits to that. We see less um, obesity, less urinary incontinence, less allergies, less thyroid disease, less bone cancer, lymph node cancer, um, spleen cancer, and mast cell tumors as a form of skin cancer. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits to leaving the ovaries, but they still have heat cycles. If you do leave the ovaries, you have to go the, all the way down to the other end of the uterus, remove the entire uterus from the ovary down past the cervix so that they don't end up with a pyometra later on. Uh, because any uterine tissue under the influence of uh, progesterone after a heat cycle can develop a pyometra, even if there's not a piece of it there, if you've taken some of it out, you have to go all the way down to the cervix. So if you do have an ovary sparing spay, make sure it's with a veterinarian that has uh, watched the video or knows how to do the ovary sparing spay by removing the cervix. Um, so big differences. I do have people that even after they've retired their breeding dogs, they still want to leave the ovaries because they want them to be their bed dog. They don't want them to have urinary incontinence and not be able to sleep in the bed with them. So it is, again, a conversation to have with your veterinarian. 
The Parmesius Foundation has a great article on it. The Therio Foundation has a great article about it. There is a Facebook page for ovary sparing spay and vasectomy veterinarians. So there's a lot of good information out there. I have a page on our website, if anybody's interested, that goes through all the advantages and disadvantages of those products or those, those procedures. So you have a couple of good resources. Um, Dr. David Waters has spoken eloquently about um, retaining hormones for dogs, male and female. So I think there's some great literature out there. You just have to research it and then have a conversation with your veterinarian about what your best choice is. Um, Jamie's just wondering, do you recommend adding chlamydia vaccine to catteries? Um, they currently don't do that. They're wondering if that's something they should consider. I would in a cattery. Uh, I think chlamydia is a pretty common organism. Um, it's not quite as bad as panleukopenia, but it is still a pretty serious disease. So I would do chlamydia. I've in the past for the last 42 years used an intranasal feline vaccine product. And I've just been told in the last couple of weeks that it's currently off the market. So that makes it a little bit harder to um, get some of the vaccines that we really like using. But yes, chlamydia, panleukopenia, rhino, khaleesi, uh, those are important. And feline leukemia is also recommended for most kittens. So again, if you go to the American Association of Feline Practitioners website, AAFP, you can find the information about the vaccination protocols. And AHA, the American Animal Hospital Association, uh, also has a great website for uh, lifestyle and appropriate vaccinations based on lifestyle. If you have more questions, visit our learning center. Um, a lot of the information that Dr. Greer covered today, we have covered in the past um, in webinars, in videos, in articles. So scan that QR code there, and that will take you right to the Revival Animal Health Learning Center. And that will give you all the information you need as well. You can search. I mean, we have literally every topic you can think of under the sun on there, I think. So, um, and a lot of the information is all right from Dr. Greer. So make sure to check that out as well. So again, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we hope you have a great rest of your day. And again, call our Pet Care Pros if we weren't able to get to your question today. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Hi, if you're watching on YouTube, consider subscribing to the Revival Animal Health YouTube channel. If you have a pet health question, call our Pet Care Pros at this number and don't miss our other pet health videos.